Matthew Barnett is the co-founder of the Los Angeles Dream Center along with his father, Tommy Barnett. Matthew is also pastor of the Angulus Temple as well as a great friend of the Sea Broadcasting. So great to have you back here on The Harvest Show. It's and good to be also here. Thank you. of the New York Times bestseller, The Cause Within You, which we'll get to in a little bit. But first, for folks who may not be familiar with the Dream Center, kind of give us a little bit of background of before you started the Dream Center. You kind of grew up in, in church and how you got started in ministry. Well, I came to Los Angeles at 20 years of age, 11th on the list of 10 prospects to take over the church. When my dad had a vision of planting a church in L.A., he got all these pastors and said, man, we're going to build a church in L.A. and do all this. And they were all excited until they saw the neighborhood and saw a bunch of uh, gang members trying to break in the back door. And all of a sudden they said, nope. I'm not on the list, and so I was 11th on the list of 10, actually. Wow. I, in fact, I wasn't even considered, but my dad needed a, f a fallback plan. He said, would you come and help me for one year take over a little building in a gang-ravaged community right there next to a liquor store in downtown Los Angeles? And I said, sure, I'll come for a year. Uh, I've been pastoring now for 17 years in the mm. heart of the inner city of Los Angeles. So I guess I just I got my contract renewed year after year, and I've been there for 17 years <laughs> wow. now. And uh, when you first got started, you kind of had a different picture of what you wanted your ministry to be like. Kind of explain that. That's, a, yeah, that's exactly right. When I came to L.A., I thought because I was Tommy Barnett's son that everybody would just come to church. You know, I've come to town and we want to come and hear you preaching. But I realized I came into an area that was totally unchurched. There was no, there was no foundation when it come to church. And so here I was, all alone, at 20 years of age, thinking, well, I'm going to open up my church on Sunday morning, and everyone's going to come to look out in a 700-seat building, and nobody was there. As a matter of fact, one Sunday, not one person showed up, <laughs> and I come from a mega church of 14,000 members. So can you imagine the humbling process I had to go through? But you know what? It became the perfect place. I tell people, sometimes when you lose it all, it could be the best thing that's ever happened to you because God just doesn't save people from rock bottom. He recreates people. And God started recreating something in my heart that was unlike anything. And we talk about in the book, it was unlike anything that I ever dreamed of. He took me on a journey of losing it all in order to discover the one thing he really wanted me to do. Wow. And Matthew, uh, did you ever have it in your heart to kind of work in that kind of environment uh, that you found yourself in, in L.A.? Well, when I was 16, I had a dream at a youth camp that someday I'd be in the city of L.A. pastoring. I didn't know mm. what that meant. I thought it meant Orange County. I thought it meant Disneyland. I thought it meant the Bible Belt of the West Coast, Orange County. I didn't know that it meant downtown Los Angeles. And when I was 20, I knew the opportunity was God. And I knew it was there. But I just didn't think it would mean being there. You know, I couldn't relate. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, right. I, didn't, I didn't know the culture I didn't know the language, and here I was, 20 years of age, trying to make it work. And so one day, I went to Echo Park after nobody showed up in my church, and I was weeping on my pillow for three hours in my apartment in downtown L.A. I said, God, I'm the biggest failure in all the world. I was crying, and all of a sudden, God spoke a word to me. He said, I want you to stop your crying. I want you to go to Echo Park. Now, for God to tell you to go to Echo Park in the middle of the night is a pretty bold word. I mean, there have been dead bodies found in the bottom of the lake and guns. I thought God was mad at me, you know, for being a big old baby. I'm just going to finish me off in a drive-by shooting and <laughs> get somebody there who really could do the job. And that night when I went to the park, I'll never forget what I saw. Young boys up against police cars being arrested. Mm. Helicopters looking for criminals. And God spoke a word to me. He said, tonight... I want you to die to your dream of being a success. I no longer want you to think about legacy. I would think about how far you need to go. Mm. And I want you to spend the rest of your life building the dreams of these young kids in the neighborhood. And that night, mm. I laid down my dream and I picked up God's cause. And I found that God's cause was greater than any dream and any plan. And any 10-year goal I could put on my wall, I picked up something better than the dream of being a great pastor. And that was... I picked up the cause of Christ. Mm. So everything was kind of uh, in turmoil. You're in this horrible neighborhood. What were sort of the, the first steps and building blocks towards where you are today in the Dream Center? Well, this is what happened. You know, I didn't have anything. And, and I tell people all the time in the book, you know, you start with whatever you have so that God can bless it. So back then, we had a little desk. And I moved outside the church. And every single day, I would answer the phones. They would, and I would say, L.A. Dream Center. I was the only staff member. I was receptionist. I was a janitor. And so they, they would call it. I would say, L.A. Dream Center. They would say, do you have a women's ministry? And you know what I did? I actually faked it and act like we had a women's ministry and changed my voice to make it sound like <laughs> we had a bigger church. We really did. And I was out there in the middle, and I had my desk, and all the moms walked their kids to school, and I learned to speak Spanish just by talking to all of them. I put candy on the middle of my desk, and, and that's all I had was one desk, a little bit of candy, and four grocery bags. And that's where the cause began. By serving with what we had in our hand, God began to bless. And I tell people all the time, you know, most people never find their cause. Not because um, they have to look for it. They just never value what they have in their hand. They never realize 
that there's dynamite in their hand, and that's just whatever they have in their hand that God wants to bless and use. And fear stops us. Not having enough stops us. And so we just sit around our whole life saying, well, I just don't have enough. And we never test the waters out there to see if God can mm. truly bless what's in our mm. hand. Mm. Uh, George Barna helped out with uh, the cause within you. And, you know, we know he's a great statistician in the, yeah. in the Christian world. But he says about 50% of, of adults in the U.S. don't feel like they've tapped into their purpose or don't even know what their, their ultimate purpose in life is, is all about. What are some of the keys to discovering that, that purpose or that cause within? Well, I tell people all the time that you never have to look for your cause. People are thinking it's going to fall from the heaven one day and hit them. Mm -hmm. I just said, you know, spend your life serving with whatever God gives you, and you'll never have to look for your cause because your cause will find you. Mm. The hurting will find you. The need will shape the vision of your life. And so I said, you know, don't look for it. Just spend your life serving, and it will find you. And that's what happened in my life. I just started serving with what God gave us. I didn't know how it was going to look like. And then now, you know, we have this big old hospital now that we have, the Queen of Angels Hospital. You've already seen pictures of 400,000 square feet right on the Hollywood Freeway. It was a miracle that God gave us mm -hmm. where 700 people are living there every single day coming up, drugs and alcohol. And um, teenagers now instead of going to Juvenile Hall, the judges are pounding the gavel and telling teenagers, you're not going to Juvenile Hall. You're now being sentenced into the house of God where teenagers, you know, homeless families, 140 of them that are living here at the Dream Center every day. That was never in my cause. That was never in my plan. Right. I just served with four food bags, went out and used what I had, and all of a sudden the need began to find me. The hurting people began to find me. And that's what the book is about. It's about ordinary people that started finding an extraordinary cause. I don't want to say by accident because it was really by purpose because you lose yourself in God and you value what you have. You, you get excited about the little that you can do and you watch God begin to expand the boundaries of what you can do. And I never dreamed that I'd be doing this ministry. I've never tried drugs and alcohol in my life. And yet we have 250 people plus that are coming off drugs and alcohol, prostitutes, runaways. And I've got causes I never even knew that I had because you just get busy using what you have. But I think uh, one of the most important things to, to mention is that it did take you a lot of time. And there were times that you yes. wanted to quit. Like uh, one time in particular, you had somebody who was actually shot on the steps of your church. Tell us about that. Yeah, when the first day I came to L.A., I'm 20 years of age. I'm the only white kid <clears throat> 10 miles in my neighborhood. And I show up in there, and there's a boy who's been killed on the steps of our church. I had to walk around his body to get to my church service. I walked in. I said, I know I'm supposed to preach my first sermon, but I can't. A boy's been killed. And they said, you know what? Leave it alone. The gang members stick to themselves. We stick to ourselves. I said, well, let's just go over there and let's pray for the family. I got no volunteers, so they gave me $38. went across the street to an apartment attached to a liquor store. I knocked on the door. The door flung open. I was staring in the face of the biggest gang member I'd ever seen in my life. He looked down at me. I looked up at him. And I looked up at God. It's said, like, God, I've always heard there's a place called heaven. Save me a place. I'm coming home real soon. And uh, I looked at the guy. He said, what do you want? I said, I'm here to pray for the family. I walked in there. I gave the, mo the mother $38. I told her, we're going to be here for you every single day. We're not leaving the neighborhood. She began to weep, and I walked out the door, and I gave her the money. I'm not like David Wilkerson, you know, who looks at gang members and says, yeah. if you chop me up, every piece of me will tell you that Jesus, Jesus loves, loves you. Now, I'm giving her the money. I'm out the door. <laughs> As I'm heading towards the door, the hand grabbed me, and again, the gang member said, I want you to stay and pray for us. I didn't know what to do. I just got out of Bible college, but it doesn't prepare you for gang ministry 101 and yeah. drive-by 102, you know. So we got, to, we got together in the circle. We began to pray. And as we prayed, the gang members lifted my hands in the air. And on that day, those gang members accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior on the very first day of being in Los Angeles. And I knew mm. that God was going to do something special from there. Mm. But isn't there so many times that, uh, you know, we want to do something even radical like that. You know, I want to go into the inner city. I want to do this ministry. <laughs> But we don't really have the longevity to, to pull that off. You know, we kind of think uh, it's going to happen overnight. You know, you're going to have your experience. Mm -hmm. You're going to go out and the next day, okay, I'm good to go. We're going to build this hospital and everything's going to be good. But it really does take a long, long time. You know, that, that's a wonderful question. 17 years of being at it. You know, there's been times I've wanted to quit. Matter of fact, I've gone on that 10 freeway to drive back to my mega church in Phoenix, Arizona at least 20 times. I'm not kidding. Mm. And I'd always stop and say, I'm going to get a Dairy Queen and think about it. And I'd eat ice cream and say, well, maybe I'll just give it one more day. You know, sometimes when God gives you a dream, all you have is 24 hours left. You can't even mm. see five years down the road. You can't even imagine 10 years down the road. And sometimes all you have to give them is one more day. That's mm -hmm. all you've got. But sometimes that's all you need to keep going. Morning by morning, his mercy is new every single day. And I've realized it. And, and the more that you crash through quitting points in your cause and in your vision, you know, the, easy, the, 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 the less the option of quitting becomes a reality. I love what my dad always says. He says only successful people can have the desire to want to quit. He says if you ever have the desire to want to quit, it means you're a success because you have something to quit. 
Hmm. Only successful people can have the desire to want to quit. But the moment you start crashing through every quitting point in your life, that desire to quit gets less and less. And now, to be honest with you, I don't think about quitting. But in the first five years, I thought about quitting every single day. It became an option. But when you give them a series of 24 hours, mm -hmm. you begin to see what God can do in your life. Matthew, with the, uh, the Queen of Angels Hospital, when did that come into play? Because uh, that, that's an incredible miracle story in and of itself. But that also came with some great, great challenges <laughs> that kind of pushed you to the, the edge of the, uh, the, the limit as well. That came four years into the operation when I was 20. I was 24. I walked in. I said, I want to buy the building. They laughed at me. The 24-year-old kid wanted to buy a $16 million building that Paramount Studios was going to use for a movie studio. Well, through a series of miracles and meeting with the church and the owners and, and the Catholic church that owned the building, they sold to us for $3.9 million. It's one of the wow. landmark buildings. It's been appraised for $65 million today years later, sitting right on the Hollywood freeway. And uh, God gave us that miracle because we were filling the houses around our old church with drug addicts and convicts that are getting saved. I tell everybody in our church, we got ex-drug addicts, we got ex-murderers, we got ex-prostitutes, we got, we got ex-pimps in our church. And that's just a pastoral yeah, staff right there. The that's exactly what else <laughs> we have. Senior you know? leadership. And, so, and, that, and that's what we have there. And so now, well, we outgrew that place and the hospital became a reality. Uh -huh. And now today, we are functioning out of that place. 24 hours, people are kicking off drugs at 2 o'clock in the morning, get their life back together again. It's the most crazy place you've ever met. Homeless people are showing up every day looking for a place to live and we're giving them a chance to restart their life and family. And, and runaways. And again, it's just one of those things to where you say, God, I'm going to just use whatever you have to serve others. I'm going to make a difference. And all of a sudden, this wonderful and glorious cause begins to shape everything that you decide to do with your yeah. life. And how important of a role does the hospital play you feel in the seat of your ministry? It's everything. I mean, we have thousands of people that come to church, but we're more, we're more known for what goes on 24 hours a day. That's who we are. You know, yeah. oftentimes people view church as Sunday. Everything is church is Sunday. Church is Sunday. And I believe that, but I believe that church is a pep rally on Sunday for what the church ought to be doing Monday through Saturday. I believe that's the rallying point for to mobilize the greatest army in the world, hmm. the church, to make a difference. We got a phone call from the social workers that told us that because you guys took in seven families... I have seven children that the, the, that the city sent to us that were homeless, seven children. We got a letter in the mail said that we saved the government $483,000 by just taking in wow. seven homeless children. That's the kind of rallying cry that the church is rising up. And this recession in America has forced the church to look in our neighborhoods, in our streets, and understand that we have an obligation to be more than just mega centers on Sunday. Yeah. The church ought to be more than just an arms race of who can have a better facility to transfer more Christians. The church ought to be the source of change in our neighborhoods Monday through Saturday, mm. making the biggest impact that the world has ever seen. This is the greatest hour, the recession in America, as far as the church making an impact. This is our time to rise up and to make a difference and to be those centers of change and a refuge right there in our local oh. communities. Well, we've got to take a quick break. We've already gotten a couple questions in. If you have one for Matthew, live at We'll be right back, so don't go anywhere.